Hello, and welcome to the Voices United Conference online. My name is Max Nolan, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next session entitled Choral Music in Corona Time, an Overview of Ideas and Approaches. We are lucky enough today to have as our presenter Michael Slon. Uh, Michael Slon is Director of Choral Music and Associate Professor at the University of Virginia. He's also the Music Director of the Oratorio Society of Virginia. We are so lucky today to get to hear his perspective and his thoughts about this truly unprecedented time in our field. And without further ado, here's the presentation. Greetings to friends, colleagues, and students at Voices United. My name is Michael Slon. It's a pleasure to be with you, even virtually today. And I hope you're staying well in these strange times. When we think back to the middle of March 2020, uh, things changed very quickly. And in our courses and our classes, we were forced to adapt uh, and innovate in a rather short period of time uh, in a field that does not easily translate to an online environment. Uh, and of course, that's a testament to the unique aspect of what we do and the power of making music together with people when we are able to be in the same room. But for now, uh, we went very quickly from this to this. An image there from The New Yorker. And of course, with a lot of this thrown in, which leads to the conclusion that these are indeed difficult times. So that said, there's work to do. Uh, and what I thought I'd do today is just offer an overview of ideas and approaches to choral music uh, in Corona time. And by no means uh, should you think this will be exhaustive. There's just too many uh, new sources of information each day and each week. Uh, and we may not cover every scenario, or every type of ensemble, but the idea is just to collect together a number of different resources and ideas in one place uh, where hopefully there will be something for everyone. Someone can find something that will help their ensemble, their students, their organization uh, in adapting to these times. And then I think, too, as we look through the schedule uh, of the Voices United sessions, uh, several other colleagues are presenting more specifically on things that may break out from topics uh, that I'm going to talk about here today. So first, just before we go through things specifically, I wanted to give you an overview outline uh, of how I'll approach this today. Um, and the first thing will be to cover some initial pedagogical and panel responses to coronavirus going all the way back to March, lay out then some guiding pedagogical principles, just particular things I've heard from a few people that may be useful in focusing how we think about this. Then I want to go into different ways we can approach uh, working with our singers. First of all, inward-facing ideas, uh, engaging ensembles and singers virtually, uh, and then also at least the possibility, hypothetically, of in-person approaches and the relation of this as well to some of the medical data and resources uh, that we have on hand. And then uh, I want to make sure also cover some things for um, congregations, folks involved in uh, uh, worship music and so on. Then we can also think about, in addition to inward facing ideas, um, outward facing ideas. So ideas, audience engagement, what can we do um, for people who are used to hearing us in person and now uh, don't have the opportunity to do so, but we still want to find ways to connect with them. Lastly, I'll close up with uh, just a few ideas about personal creativity and then looking ahead, how we might um, envision ourselves emerging from this time. Okay, so first, take a look at a couple of the initial uh, responses when everything started turning upside down back about the middle of March. Uh, and one of the first groups to respond uh, was NCCO, the National Collegiate Choral Organization, with a series of webinars um, that they 
have posted, and you can see the website there, the archived website on the screen, on a variety of topics. Admittedly, um, the the title topic and what actually took place in the discussion didn't quite always align, uh, but there was a lot of good uh, information, and uh, the topics have ranged from, you know, how do we do choir online, maintaining choral culture online, meaning beyond the music, how do we also stay connected, uh, topics about auditions, teaching, conducting, etc. And for those who are interested, then I would encourage you to take a look at those. Um, and I think some of them may also be archived on YouTube, and they've uh, provided some redacted transcripts of the thrust of the discussion uh, with the panelists on those. Then, of course, uh, we had in May the um, conversation presented by ACDA, Course America, Nats, and several other organizations uh, that certainly sent shockwaves uh, through the choral world. And that was the discussion, of course, that looked at uh, some of the health aspects and then came to some rather bleak conclusions about how soon or not soon uh, we would be able to get back to choral singing. Uh, there have, of course, been uh, other opinions put out there uh, about those facts, and I'm going to come back to them a little later. And of course, some of the way we would get back to singing may depend greatly on the demographic of your particular group, uh, whether you're working with young people or if you have a group that may span six decades of people. Um, there are, uh, in some ways, different issues in terms of risk uh, involved. Um, in June, this ACDA report came out, the COVID-19 Response Committee report. It's about 100 pages long here at the site listed there. And this takes a very thorough approach by each level, middle school, high school, college, and so on, looking at various scenarios um, for how one could teach um, remotely, in a hybrid situation, or in person. And uh, it's worth kind of taking a, a, a skim at least through that document. There's a lot of ideas and, and uh, data in there which could prove useful in terms of thinking about the various uh, scenarios. And in that document, uh, it does not leave out the uh, in-person possibilities. Then, of course, other organizations like NAFME have put up uh, significant amounts of resources. And uh, I show one page there from their COVID-19 resources. Um, and again, as resources amass, it's almost boggling to try to track through everything that has been posted or offered uh, as a tool or an idea in this time. But this way you have some idea of some of the major uh, resources that are available uh, as we try to move forward. Now, uh, you, like me, I'm sure, have had many conversations with colleagues and friends in the field um, about what we're contemplating to do as we um, look to the new academic year. And uh, it's been interesting to me to hear some of the guiding pedagogical principles that uh, some of our colleagues have voiced. And I just wanted to put a few on the screen here. Obviously, there are many, many ideas and approaches but that may help occasionally frame for us uh, what we need to keep in mind as a central goal or guiding, guiding principle uh, in adapting to the strange situation. So the first is I heard one educator say um, that she hoped that we could care for our students through the design of meaningful musical experiences. And I think the emphasis there was on the, the, the phrase meaningful musical experiences. Um, meaning in the spring we got stuck adapting very quickly and uh, it's not always easy to do that with choral music. Uh, and you end up doing something to uh, keep people occupied but not necessarily the most um, engaging in terms of the musical goals uh, that we may be trying to achieve. Now that we've had a little more time to ramp up and admittedly not necessarily knowing exactly what will happen in the fall or what it'll be like, a lot of people of course have said, I, I just don't know, and it can change weekly. But the, as we look ahead, uh, it's useful to think, okay, for the student, what is actually gonna advance their musical education and not just take up their time? 
Uh, and I think that's, of course, near and dear to all of us. And, and it's helpful to remember this. We're so good at doing what we do normally uh, in normal times. And now we find ourselves kind of on a, a different track and having to still bring the same kind of um, values to the table, just in a different form. One other thought uh, before I continue. I think I could put it best like this. I have a feeling that's what all of our choirs are going to sound like to us when we finally have a chance to be back with them. And I think even as we talk about creating meaningful musical experiences, um, I think it's important that we allow ourselves to be a bit patient with ourselves in the understanding that for a while, uh, many may be without their two greatest, our two greatest musical resources, which are, of course, the musical works themselves and the community of a fully convened ensemble. It's a bit like uh, we will be asked to play baseball, but without the game itself or the full team. Another educator said that they wanted to think about what was best for the ensemble and the student once we get back to normal, meaning having a longer view as well, uh, thinking what's going to help my organization, my group, uh, be strong when we come out of this. And that can also, I'm sure, relate not only to the experiences in the moment, but ideas about recruitment and engaging new people or even returning people uh, to get us through to the time when we can be back together in the normal way. I think that's a useful thing to think about because I'm sure many folks uh, among us are trepidatious about what ensembles will be like when we come out the other side and will there have been attrition and lower enrollments or lower recruiting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, I'm sure many of you have already uh, encountered this and experienced this, but the question of um, what are the equity and access issues involved uh, and particularly for certain groups among our students uh, and constituents. And I think that's also very important to reflect on. Um, uh, it's not equal for everyone when we're, for example, in an online environment, and how can we keep people engaged and help them have the resources and the opportunities uh, that they need to succeed uh, and, and stay engaged during this time? And I think an important point. And lastly, um, how can we contribute and care for our community? And in that sense, you can think about your community as your, your music students or your institution, but also beyond that in some ways. Um, our audiences or the communities that we serve through music. Uh, obviously, we do many different kinds of ensembles and they have different ways of interacting with our community. And, and those people are also missing the valuable things we offer them through music. So there's a question of how do we uh, kind of attend to that during this time. Okay, so now what I'm going to do again is turn to inward facing ideas for your ensemble. Before I do that, I have to say, I've been sitting here as I make this, trying to figure out what feels so strange. And of course, part of it is that all of us doing these uh, remotely have no audience initially. I think so many of us are used to speaking with, interacting uh, with and in front of audiences. It feels strange, like one of those uh, uh, comedians who has no one laughing when they tell the joke and so on. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully we'll get back to being with everybody soon. So in the meantime, grab a cup of coffee and go light on the multitasking and we'll see what we can offer here. So going on again, back to inward facing ideas. Uh, I mentioned the ACDA report from June. Uh, and in that, they go through several categories for each uh, level of singer or student. Um, for example, just the three categories of face-to-face -face, uh, music making with social distancing, a hybrid form of instruction, and then fully remote or online uh, instruction. And they go through that um, fairly specifically, as I say, for each level with sample lesson plans, with uh, outlines of what some of the technical uh, resources involved in each level might be, 
uh, and so on. And I think it's worth taking a look at that. Um, they make an interesting statement, I think, in one of the, the, the preface or something of that document. Uh, and they say, ideally, times of crisis should not jeopardize choral music enrollment and participation. Thus, the upcoming year must serve to meet musical goals and simultaneously provide a sense of community such that singers continue to participate in singing. I think that makes a lot of sense. And as I said earlier, the challenge is uh, if we don't have two of our biggest resources, our two main resources, which is the music itself that we would be normally making en masse and also our full community together in the room. Um, and so that is going to pose a lot of interesting challenges if, if that is a situation that we continue to face uh, for a little while. So a, a couple of the possibilities that you can, can consider as you look forward to the fall, and I'm sure obviously all of you are already thinking about this. Um, if one is online, of course, the, the and we'll talk first about some of the online and hybrid before I go to in-person. There's the idea of virtual rehearsals uh, uh, through, for example, let's say Zoom. Some of you may have tried this where you lead uh, perhaps from a piano while everyone else is on mute. Um, and there's, of course, none of the satisfaction of everyone hearing each other sing or having any way to relate the sound to each other. And yet I've still heard from some singers that at times they really appreciate this chance to just vocalize and, and to see each other on the screen. Um, and that ACDA document makes the suggestion there are the possibility for both muted and unmuted exercises, meaning you could potentially, depending on sound quality and numbers, do unmuted exercises that don't depend uh, on time or rhythm and then therefore don't involve um, the latency issues um, that come up with, of course, most online platforms. Other projects can include uh, having your students work on pieces uh, remotely and uh, submitting recordings for analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when you're thinking about uh, online instruction, of course, there's also the question of synchronous versus asynchronous. So sometimes you may want to record um, projects or lessons for them, and then they can respond uh, however they may. We'll get to that in, in a minute. Uh, another a way to look at kind of approaches with students in particular would be the kind of smorgasbord approach. And I wanted to show you here um, something that came from a colleague of ours uh, up in New York State. This is uh, Doreen Freiling. And she very helpfully, a couple months ago, posted uh, on her website uh, a kind of grab bag approach for educators where she offered her students a number of options, say 15 options um, that they could choose from as they went through. And uh, I've got the website there on the screen if you want to visit it. I'll just outline a couple of the things that she does is she tries to make clear, first of all, what some of the uh, purposes of an exercise might be and have the students answer specifically to that. And then she she offers them the options. This, I think she teaches high school, so these would be perhaps particularly appropriate to that level. Um, she suggested, for example, conducting a piece that they had previously performed and submitting a recording of that video, uh, composing a piece either with notation or orally in some format where you would stack up parts on, on top of yourself, taking a pre-existing melody and harmonizing that, uh, analyzing, say, online performances or comparing several performers doing the same particular piece, um, taking the more musicological approach and doing research on a piece or set of pieces that uh, they may have been performing at school or that they may be interested in. And also um, uh, more of a kind of a ethnographic project where you could interview someone about their life in music and then submit a report on that. So, uh, and I think she used Google Classroom or some platform like that for submission. So you may have a look at that. Um, I think she had a lot of good ideas for educators and hope, I know some of um, my colleagues in the high school level had borrowed some of them with their students and found it uh, helpful. Another thing would be to direct um, singers to resources that exist online that may help them expand their skills. So you'll see here on the screen, uh, for example, some platforms like Sight Reading Factory, uh, musictheory.net, uh, U-Theory, which is run by a former student of mine, Greg Risto, and Smart Music that also I think has 
uh, free ways to notate music. And in, in several of these cases, the platforms are free or can be accessed for free for a period of time. Uh, and it could give your singers a chance to uh, take on a particular skill uh, that you may want them to work on. Sight reading <laughs> never hurts. And uh, have them develop that in this time when they might otherwise uh, be focusing on, on learning a piece for the next concert. I've also included two resources there that can assist with learning parts for the music and other aspects of managing choral rehearsal somewhat remotely. Uh, My Choral Coach, which is from Match My Sound uh, in collaboration with GIA and ACDA. Uh, and of course, uh, many of you will also be familiar with Cyberbase. I've talked to educators who have used Spotify to create playlists or have their students create playlists uh, that can draw attention to particular repertoires or expand their understanding of a particular genre um, or a particular composer. Uh, speaking of that, um, one of the options to engage your singers virtually would be in fact to have a composer visit. And we did exactly this this spring uh, at UVA. We were singing uh, Jake Runestad's piece uh, that was the Brock Commission at the National Convention last year, the Beethoven piece. Uh, and of course, we didn't uh, have a chance to do it in the concert. So Jake was uh, gracious and joined us uh, for an afternoon. And I just, I had the singers uh, prepare questions ahead of time and I vetted them and then would just have them you know, ask their questions so it was a little more organized rather than people sitting around waiting to think of something. And I have to say it was a very fruitful conversation. I think Jake enjoyed it as well. And in fact, it was it was um, quite fascinating to get inside his process and hear what he thinks about when he's composing a piece. Uh, I think he even played us some uh, outtakes uh, uh, of himself just singing and uh, recording himself singing as he was coming up with motives and ideas. And that's something that um, well, of course, we would have rather performed the piece. It, that's something that probably wouldn't have happened in a normal semester uh, with the time crunch. So it was great that we had a chance uh, to connect with him. And I'm sure there are other composers all around um, who would be interested to connect with singers who are working on their music. Um, of course, there's always the possibility of doing a virtual choir. And uh, obviously, people have strong opinions in various ways about the value or lack of value about this. But I will say it does give people um, the teleological, it gives them a goal, a purpose. And, and I think that can be helpful when we are missing concerts. And it also gives us something to present uh, to the public. And there have been many very kind of successful and beautiful uh, achievements in trying to do this, even though it is not the same as being together in a choral ensemble. And of course, we should remember it's not the same, I think everyone does, as being um, together in a choral ensemble. Um, when we get into that experience of producing virtual choir, I can tell you we did it two ways uh, in the spring. The first was um, the one you see the image of on the left, uh, more of a chamber choir with, with several instruments. And we uh, assembled it ourselves. I edited it, the audio. One of my very talented students had worked on the video. And it's amazing, as you've probably found if you do it yourself, how much time it can take. You know, just throw out a number like 40 hours for two minutes of music. So you may also then decide uh, at some point, depending on funding, you want to get the professionals involved. Uh, and that's what resulted in the image you see on the right when we did one with a larger choir, the UVA University Singers. Um, for commencement at UVA when we had a virtual commencement. Um, they had asked us to, uh, to prepare that. Uh, and so it was helpful to have them involved in terms of the time and the amount of data in terms of videos and audio to get something uh, together. Uh, there are various options, and I've just put a few on the screen. These don't constitute any endorsement of products or companies, but just some resources you can think about. First of all, in the do-it-yourself mode, uh, obviously helps for the students to have at least a cell phone and if they can separate the audio out with a mic into GarageBand or something that's helpful. Um, you may have iMovie on a computer which can work uh, although once you get into the more fancy things it helps to have all these other programs Logic Pro, Pro Tools, Final Cut Pro etc etc etc. Audacity uh, and uh, one of my students was using PreSonus Studio One 
So I've just put a list of some of them up there that in combination or on their own can help you make one of these projects. There are of course some apps out there, uh, the so-called acapella app. I love how they spell it wrong, I guess probably intentionally uh, for branding reasons. Um, the acapella app I think has helped people assemble very smaller choir projects. I think it has an upper limit uh, of how many singers you can put on it. Uh, Band Lab, I've been told, is a product, I haven't used it myself, but that can uh, assemble audio. And just as one example of companies, um, again, not a, not endorsement or not, but uh, it's a group I have worked with, the Virtual Choir uh, Company, uh, was run by Arts Laureate, which is, have been doing, they are a professional recording company who does very high level work. Uh, and they've kind of obviously pivoted in this time into more of um, of virtual choir work and so on. So those are a few ideas. If with any of our ensembles, um, you're contemplating that project, many of you may have already tried it. And I have a feeling other people at this conference are gonna be uh, presenting more specifically on uh, some of those possibilities. One thing to keep in mind this came up as we worked on it, is copyright issues. You may end up in territory that you're not used to being in um, when you are putting out material uh, online more than you normally do. Um, and so just to share a few things that I've learned in, uh, a little more about in the past couple months, obviously mechanical rights are the ones that you need if you're gonna put out a CD or some kind of audio uh, recording. Uh, and you may be familiar with those. But sync rights uh, are what uh, are required anytime you combine video imagery or any video presentation, even if it's not live concert footage, with audio. Uh, this gets into the realm of sync rights. And if you have, for example, a standard uh, BMI or ASCAP license, uh, those do not cover and cannot cover sync rights. Sync rights have to be arranged uh, with uh, um, individual publishers and so on and so forth. Now, of course, if, if you've got something off CPDL or you're something well within fair use, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and there are other examples. I've talked with some copyright lawyers, uh, our counsel at, at the university about some of this. There are other arguments that can be made for fair use. Uh, and in fact, YouTube, if you put something on YouTube, as opposed to initially posting it on Facebook or Instagram, whatever, YouTube itself has um, some built-in copyright protection because of the way their algorithms work and the way uh, publishers and so on can search and actually collect rights. Um, that may be something for you to consider. Um, but either way, it, it helps to do one's homework on this. And uh, I just also mentioned there, um, ACDA has uh, on their website um, expanded resources and some uh, about copyright. There's one link there. Also, if you're involved in worship music, um, there's the uh, listing right there, which uh, for uh, simulcasts, I think, which that also involves sync rights for uh, worship music. That's just one example. Uh, I'm sure there are others that you can uh, find and, um, and make use of. So one other question about inward facing and connecting to your chorus before we move um, to a couple other things. And that would be, we all know that in addition to pursuing musical excellence, uh, it's important to us to build community, uh, help people connect to each other. This is obviously something that they value highly about the experience and, and form this esprit de corps uh, that goes with a normal ensemble. And that's going to be extra challenging to do in this time. So obviously you want to employ our brains in terms of how we can maintain that uh, as well. And uh, I'm sure there are many ways to do it. The things that can happen are to have uh, um, just social time on Zoom with your choir as opposed to structured rehearsal time, perhaps even outside of rehearsal time uh, so that you keep those separate. But it, it's, of course, up to you. I'm one of my community groups, the bases meet, uh, I think it's like... Uh, base happy hour every uh, every Monday evening and um, that that's a way for people to stay connected I've seen people try um, trivia with their ensembles and um, depending on what you put in the quiz that could actually be quite educational and fun and all together 
So I'm sure there are many ideas, but it's just something to also keep in mind, this idea of how do we um, keep connected in, in such a strange time. Sounds like the psalm. Okay, in-person approaches. Uh, let me first of all say that uh, the ACD report smartly says no one size fits all. So that what could work in one place or with one group would be not at all advisable or wise with another type of group. Um, and whatever I say here, let's be clear, I'm not making any kind of endorsement or recommendation um, because there's far more health information and guidance and so on that would supersede anything I would say. Uh, and, and each group and director is going to have to make some personal and, and perhaps challenging choices, excuse me, about how they want to um, approach uh, what they're going to do with their group. Uh, in talking uh, about all this, I think it's important to go back again for a moment and reference some of the health data. Uh, again, I refer you to that webinar uh, co-hosted by several organizations. It's listed at the top of the screen. Uh, of course, there's going to be at any moment um, the recommendations of the CDC and also uh, the one's state guidelines uh, from where we happen to live. Uh, and I've also listed a couple other resources on the screen, particularly what some people are referring to as a Colorado study. Um, it involves doctors uh, from both University of Colorado and I believe from uh, University of Maryland who have studied a couple individual instruments and a soprano singer uh, in terms of aerosol transmission and those factors that would play into any kind of live rehearsal setting as it might relate to spreading um, COVID or, or, or how it would impact people in the room and what distance would they have to be, masks, etc. So important information to consider. Um, everybody has to weigh the, the risks uh, with their institutions and organizations. Um, but the report was somewhat hopeful about safety involved, particularly uh, if anything happens with a mask and singing with a mask at a social distance presumably greater than the normal social distancing uh, practiced around, you know, just out on the street. And so if we were going to talk about in-person singing, uh, here would hypothetically be some thoughts and ways uh, that it could be approached. First, I think everyone understands uh, that we'd be looking at smaller group possibilities. Um, the large choirs and everybody crammed in a room obviously will not be happening for some time, but there's still value, and I know from talking to my own students, a desire to, if possible, and if possible to do it safely, that the, that the joy of making music together in any form uh, would be in some ways preferable to other online options, etc., if it, if it can happen. So we'll just have to see, but um, the idea, again, as I uh, show here on the screen, would be in large spaces to have few people uh, presumably with particular air handling requirements uh, and masks and to be socially distanced uh, and find ways to, to rehearse. It may require uh, a microphone for the conductor to be heard and so on. There's also the possibility of outdoors, obviously not acoustically ideal, but that may also, uh, depending on the winds, be safe um, in some ways. Shorter rehearsal times uh, may be uh, a factor. If one has flexibility to adjust the schedule, etc., that may work better at colleges, depending. But uh, uh, that may be a possibility. I have a feeling actually attention spans are something that all of us will have to reclaim, teachers and students, conductors and singers alike, uh, once we get back from this. Without the pressure of having, or actually the, the uh, kind of goal of having full concerts in the near future. Uh, that allows for reduced size of repertoire and therefore um, you can dig in on something or move slower just depending on the circumstance, but have the ability to keep people singing. At the same time, uh, rehearsal could involve non-singing moments, whether that involves something from a musicological angle, you know, a lecture on some aspect of vocal pedagogy, some work on audiation, uh, or a situation where you have uh, even alternating singers and observers 
uh, on different days and such that this, the singers would be further spaced out and, and then the observers further back from them just to keep more sense of distancing. Depending on if you have assistants, st uh, um, student leaders, assistant conductors, etc., uh, there's the possibility of sectionals, uh, meaning multiple small groups functioning at the same time if space would allow for that. And then, of course, any in-person approach uh, should be very particular about reviewing singer safety uh, mechanisms and hygiene protocols. Is there a situation where people are going to be taking temperature as you come in the room or checking uh, uh Sim off symptoms have you not had any symptoms in so such and such period of time and conductor safety as well uh, I mentioned there an idea I've heard from one colleague that uh, and in fact I've heard this from several schools and drama departments involved as well building plexiglass barriers or um, having plexiglass shields uh, that would uh, protect the leader from um, uh, certain things that might be coming that direction I can't speak to the science uh, of that, but it presumably could be helpful. So those are just a few ideas if people are finding that their school systems are going to be back, as I've heard from some states, and that students in small groups will be allowed to have some form of uh, socially distanced ensemble music making. Uh, just to say a word too about worship communities and congregations, obviously uh, places of worship have taken quite a variety of approaches uh, in returning as we open phase three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Some are still doing fully pre-recorded uh, services. Some are doing a, a live service that's live streamed to a remote congregation in, in general. Some are hosting limited size congregations. So obviously musical options may vary accordingly with those. Uh, I do know that some of the recommendations involve that there be no congregational singing um, at services, and that's probably wise. Um, but I've also put up a couple guides there, an interesting story from NPR as well, uh, that may be interested, uh, may be interesting to those of you who are uh, predominantly involved in uh, uh, worship music of some kind. One other thought on live performance before I move to outward facing ideas for a moment. That is, some of you that are more tech savvy may be exploring or have heard about some of these options that would involve a, a, a way to overcome the latency involved in uh, performing together online. Um, a couple of the platforms I've heard of, of course, are Soundjack or Jamkazam. Uh, and I, I understand that there is a way, if you have the right connections and the equipment, you can uh, make music with people in different places uh, simultaneously. But of course, I have a feeling that the bar to get to that level technologically will probably be too high for a lot of groups. Um, it may be something you want to explore. Uh, some of my physics friends also tell me there's the matter if, for example, you're at a university campus of some kind of grounds, that uh, that the latency factor, if you're on the single internet system, if that is under a certain millisecond value, uh, it may also be possible to have some simultaneity. But that is, a, again, something that people would have to explore uh, individually in trying to find ways to uh, connect that way. Okay, wanted to switch here just before we wrap up to outward facing ideas and audience engagement. Um, those of you that have community or, or professional choirs, your boards may be asking you about this and in fact uh, uh, asking quite uh, intently about this. Um, what can you do? Uh, I think a lot of us expect it'll be a bit of time still before there's gonna be live concerts as we have known them. Uh, but there are things to do. And first, I wanted to put on the screen here for you some resor uh, resources about uh, audience audiences and halls. Um, the first one is from the Colleen Dylan Schneider, uh, an interesting um, uh, assessment of data about audiences returning to the hall. And she, uh, she has continually updated on her site uh, various assessments of return to cultural institutions of a variety of kind, not just uh, a variety of kinds, not just concert halls. Then you'll see another post there that focuses more on the financial considerations of a hall. For example, if it's a presenting hall, if they have to be at only a certain capacity, is it evenly financially worth their while to open and what, what that would lead to? 
The CDC has some formal postings about uh, large events. And then I also post a page there um, from the Course Connection blog, which may be relevant for, uh, for example, community courses in terms of how you think about planning a season in relation to some of those factors. So if it's a while before anything looks like this, then we need to come up with some other ideas and ways we can create content while still, and I say this quite seriously, while still maintaining our artistic integrity and values. So here are some options I put on the screen. Um, one is re-release of recordings, uh, if they are appropriate for public release, obviously different than uh, just the, the run-of-the-mill archival thing, but if you feel it's something you can put out there and want to be proud of, um, obviously a variety of ways you can get it out there uh, through the internet, through radio, and even TV. We are um, fortunate that recently we had a, a world premiere project uh, piece by the Virginia composer Adelphus Halstork uh, that we uh, had filmed and were able to re-edit and screen on regional PBS. Uh, and it's nice when you can also connect with with audiences that way and, and offer that to them. Um, there's the possibility of creating new virtual concert programs, at least in the short term, um, which could be virtual choirs. They could be in-person recording with a with a rather small group, or obviously some hybrid of all of the above, or even uh, combine newly made material with pre-existing material. Obviously, and then you could. Um, curate that into some kind of concert experience perhaps and release it. Whether you want to monetize that or not is of course up to you, but it does provide ways to connect with audiences and, and engage them and offer them something they are otherwise not uh, perhaps getting. And it keeps your organizations in front of the audience. You can also uh, create alternate audience experiences. Um, I've seen some people hosting uh, a trivia night. There was the the, the so-called beer choir image I put up earlier, and or the idea of a listening party, which is something I think we're going to try this fall, where instead of presenting an actual performance, it would be more like a, a lecture concert. You might talk about a piece or have a guest and talk with them about a piece or pieces and then play excerpts or play a whole piece. And in that way, draw people who may be hungry at home for a musical experience into something uh, that they can enjoy and connect with uh, but in, in lieu of an in-person experience and until we can get back to the concert hall. And then of course there's all the non-musical ways you can engage your audiences and your alumni and your supporters and uh, that'll be something for all of us to also keep in mind. I wanted to wrap up today um, with a thought about personal creativity and a thought about looking ahead. And first of all, uh, you'll see this quote on the screen from the great poet, Rainer Maria Rilke. Your solitude will be a support and a home for you, even in the midst of very unfamiliar circumstances. And from it, you will find all your paths. Uh, and those of you who know, if you've ever read Letters to a Young Poet, um, his kind of insistence and in, in belief in the value of solitude and, and, and uh, silence, quiet time, and so on. Uh, and I think one thing I just want to encourage all of us is that in a time already and in, in looking ahead when we may be away from what we normally do, um, there are other avenues for creativity and the, and the solitude that has resulted from this time, while not good in some ways, can offer us creative space that is actually necessary to create and that we can then employ this uh, uh, to make something that we may otherwise not have made. Uh, and that can also be a beautiful thing artistically and otherwise. And then in terms of looking ahead, uh, I'm sure we all feel that we miss music in this time, even though we may not even realize how much. I think there are dehumanizing aspects of the isolation involved, uh, the necessary isolation involved right now. But, you know, music has this invisible power in the way it works in our world as we're doing it. And we may therefore not even be seeing the ways it's it's um, not working or that we're missing it at the moment. And that this leads in some senses to higher anxieties uh, in other um, fronts. Uh, so we'll look forward to its return. But I wanted to offer a thought 
from Yo-Yo Ma. This was an interview um, in June in the New York Times uh, related to this specific time. He said, how do we collaborate with the purpose of having legitimate hope? How do we do everything possible to rebuild toward the world that we really want to live in? Uh, what I was think is fascinating about that second half of the of the thought is um, thinking beyond the pandemic uh, and thinking about what do we want to rebuild and what n new do we want to build? What kind of world do we want to have after all this is uh, over? And so I encourage all of us to think about that as as we look ahead. Uh, even as we have to get through the uh, the daily times of uh, and 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 restrictions and challenges um, of this pandemic. So, in closing, uh, it's been good to, to be with you today. Uh, I want to thank Pam McDermott, Amy Moyer, and others for their work on our virtual Voices United conference. And hopefully, something uh, in this overview today. Uh, will be useful to you as you navigate the um, uncharted paths ahead. Uh, I think we're going to go in a moment here to a live Q&A, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So look forward to connecting with you on that. And just as a last kind of offering of hope, I'm going to put up a somewhat lighthearted um, image here and website. One of my uh, creations while I was at home during this pandemic, some of you will be familiar with Handel's coronation anthem, Zadok the Priest, of course, of the famous arpeggiated opening and then the big choral exclamation. And, of course, if so many of you are also familiar with Journey's great hit, Don't Stop Believing. And I just had the idea uh, to, uh, as they say, mash them up on the piano. So I've made a little video here that combines Zadok and Don't Stop Believing. If you want to take a minute to watch that, that's a little bit of a, as I say, an offering to my friends and colleagues in the field uh, for hope uh, and a little bit of joy in this time. So thanks again so much, and I look forward to connecting here on the Q&A. Take care. Stay well.